I think we have one special announcement mm -hmm. that Claire and I are both very excited about, and that is, um, back by public demand, mm -hmm. Godless Bitches 2.0 will reboot beginning in February. So, right. yes, thank you. <laughs> so it will be me, Tracy, and Claire um, doing Godless Bitches 2.0. So stay tuned for more announcements on that. Yeah. All right, so um, you have a special episode yep. on evolution you want to talk about, yep. and there's a reason that you're passionate about this subject, so I want you to tell us a little bit about okay. your background and All right. what you do. Okay, I, uh, I mean, I'm Dr. Claire Wilner. I have a PhD actually in biology, specializing in entomology and behavior. Um, behavior uh, and entomology were just what I specialized in. I try to learn everything I can about biology. Um, when I moved to Texas, it became really clear to me that learning and understanding science was super key. Uh, I was raised in Iowa where the education system very much emphasized great science. I had an amazing science uh, background when I was in Iowa. The high school was top notch. Um, so coming here, I became very, it became very clear that uh, People's opinion on science uh, shouldn't be an opinion, and, and I needed to do something about that. So I became very active in uh, fighting against the State Board of Education uh, to get science taught in the schools here. Um, other things that I've done that are in support of reason and um, the secular world is um, I'm on the board of the ACA here and also on Foundation Beyond Belief which is another great secular organization. Um, so, um, I think where this all started was I was attending that State Board of Education uh, hearing in 2009, and uh, there was a press conference going on uh, where Kathy Miller was speaking. She's with the Texas Freedom Network. And a woman walked through while the speaker was talking and said, my granddaddy was not an ape. And uh, of course, everybody stopped for a moment. And here's the thing, there isn't anybody in that room who disagrees with that. If you're a scientist, you're not gonna agree with that either. Um, but what it said to me is that there is, among folks who don't understand what evolution means, that there's a visceral reaction to not wanting to be evolved from the great apes. And I think uh, that's why I started doing this, to try to deal with people uh, having difficulties with evolution. So Mark, if you could start the slideshow, please. That'd be great. Okay. Um, so, whoop, there I went too fast. All right, so, Let's start with the basics. Um, just, we're gonna talk about headaches. Everybody gets them, we know they're real. No uh, mystery there. Um, so what th the difference is, is that uh, if we wanna understand what causes headaches, we have to ask questions, do research, and um, maybe come up with a drug, um, uh, maybe, something called hammered, hammer that ha headache, get hammered, whatever. Uh, so if you have enough data all pointing to the same thing causing headaches, then eventually you might have what you could call a theory of headaches. So just to summarize that really quickly, headaches are real, nobody questions that. What causes them? There's a lot of science behind it, a lot of study that needs to go on, and so if we had everything pointing to the same thing causing headaches, we could have a theory of headaches. We've seen this before. You have, I don't care where you are in the religious spectrum. If you have uh, uh, bacteria, you know that that caused illness. We did not always know that. At one point, we thought it may be B ether or whatever. We now know that cells, germs, cost, cause um, illness. So we know it's real. What causes it? There's a whole theory about how germs cause it, and that's called germ theory or cell theory. Uh, gravity, we all know that's real. 
no argument there. It is a fact. There is a huge body of science studying the attraction of things to one another. It is not terribly well understood. It's still a fact, but we have theory of gravity, which is where science studies that. And you know that evolution, and scientists say this all the time, is a fact. If you don't think you know it, let me tell you why I think you know it. If you get a flu shot, you know it. The flu shot that worked last year is not going to work this year because the organism that causes flu evolves from year to year. You get a new one. That's evolution. It's just a change in the organism over time. In Australia, the cane toad was introduced, and over a very short period of time, that organism, that a species of frog, a toad, excuse me, has evolved to have legs that are better at hopping, going greater distance. Uh, that, that's evolution. It's a fact. All right? So evolution is a fact. The same way gravity is a fact, germs are a fact, no different. We know it's real. That's what scientists mean when they say evolution is a fact. When we say it's a theory, that doesn't mean we're guessing. It means that that's how we're studying to find out what causes that evolution. So, I hope that's pretty clear. I wish I could somehow have feedback from people listening. Maybe you'll uh, write in or uh, somehow let us know. Well, if, if I understand it, it basically uh, I've often described evolution as the overall model that explains all the facts. Mm -hmm. And it's contradicted by none of the facts. Yep. And it's tested all the time. Mm -hmm. But that model, that theory part, is what allows us to make predictions like which, uh, what should the flu vaccine contain this year so that it will prevent the maximum number of flu cases. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's the science. Uh, evolution has tremendous ability to predict uh, a result, and that's something that's uh, not very well understood. When I have, I have a lot of um, difficulties with evolution that I'm going to be talking about hopefully over uh, several shows, uh, um, if they'll invite me back. And uh, there are, I have eight right now. My husband, who is from the latch on the buckle of the Bible Belt, uh, he sat with me and I said, so what exactly is it that makes people react like they do to evolution where it seems so obvious to me? And he just outlined these ideas, boom, 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 brilliant. So I'm gonna, there are eight of them, and I'm going to talk about just one of them today. And uh, I'm going to first tell you what they all are. So um, back to the slides, if you would, Mark. Thank you. Um, so the very first one, it's emotionally icky. That thing that the woman said at the State Board of Education hearing, um, my granddaddy was not an ape. OK, we'll deal with that one today. The What we would call incredulity, like, I can't believe it. What about the missing links? There's just so much I don't get about it. Um, the, probably one of the ones that comes up for me when I talk to people a lot is understanding the scale of time there. It is a long, long time to be talking about millions and billions of years, and I will be dealing with that. Um, the lack of evidence. They feel like there's no evidence. I am going to spend, if I, if I get to do this again, and I really hope I do, uh, time talking about nothing but the evidence that we have supporting evolution. Uh, science likes to talk about how evolution makes just much, so much more sense. It's, it's parsimonious. It's simple. Well, if you're religious and you simply say that God did it all, that seems far more simple. I get that. And we're going to talk about that, too. Number six is that evolution is ungodly. And there's a notion that evolution and religion can never uh, be in the same room together. And we'll talk about that. And also, what's the big deal? Uh, you can do plenty of science without being uh, uh, somebody who accepts evolution. Sure you can. Why are scientists, in, especially in, in biology, so obsessed with it? We'll talk about that. And then the black box. This is the toughest one, I think, for most people. If you want to understand how an engine works, you peek under the hood. Or a computer, you tear it apart, you figure it out. 
uh, evolution. We can't exactly get inside a cell and the average person, they, they just can't look in there and see what's going on. So this, I'm going to explain the mechanism by which it happens. That might sound scary and, and horrible, but trust me, I can bring it to anybody. Alrighty, so let's deal with Icky. My granny was not an ape, that's fine, I get it. When you're approaching the great ape house, what do you think about? The smell, um, it's cramped, the animals, you know, they're hairy, they walk around on their knuckles, they're usually unkempt, uh, they don't seem terribly bright, they seem kind of lazy and dull, and these are all things that we don't find to be something that we would want to be closely related to. I get it. I really do. Um, it's like if you're this lovely little ground squirrel and somebody says to you, you are a rodent and so is this naked mole rat. And by the way, that naked mole rat is an actual species. It exists and it is a rodent. It is in the exact, it is in the same family as that squirrel. Yikes. I don't think the squirrel wants to be related to that any more than a lot of people want to be related to a gorilla. I get it. But let's get down to basics. When you study anything, there, has, there have to be categories. There have to be names. Otherwise, you can't communicate. So the first thing that uh, science that likes to do is put things into categories. If you look at all these organisms on this slide, there's horses and octopus and trees and all sorts of stuff. And if you just look at it as a normal person or scientist, don't care who you are, you see categories probably. You don't have to look too hard. Um, so for instance, we put all, I would probably put teeny things that you see under a microscope in one category, and that's fair. We might all put things that don't have brains but are pretty big um, in one category. We might have put think we might put things that don't have a skeleton in one care in in one category, um, but have brains. They have brains as well. These have brains and a skeleton, um, and then these have neither. But they can make food with nothing but sunlight and water and air. That's pretty cool. And this, well, this is the oddball. It doesn't have brain. It doesn't do photosynthesis. It's got all sorts of weird things. So it's all by itself. We can look at a group of organisms that are less obvious. Like you can obviously tell that a, a tree and a walrus are in different groups. But when you look at all these parrots here uh, and parakeets, they're, they're fairly similar. How do you categorize them? Well, scientists, uh, we, we look at these and we look for similarities. Um, some, and so in this particular case, they're able to separate these into three major groups. And what we look at as scientists to separate them is the New Zealand parrots are all fairly, um, they're, a lot of them are flightless and they nest on the ground largely. That's their sort of thing that separates them out. The cockatoos, pretty obvious. They have that lovely doodad on their head and they have um, short, shorter beaks. And then the true parrots over on the right there, obviously they have the long hooked beaks and they don't have any doodads on their heads. Um, so those can be categorized fairly easily. Insects, this is my bag right here, baby. And uh, they're not as easy to categorize. If you look at this, and you're not an entomologist, how you categorize these might, might be kind of tricky. If you look in the upper left-hand corner at the ladybug and the critter that's directly to its right, uh, would you say those go together? They actually don't. Um, they are so very different re in reality. And if you look at the two blue insects up on the right, they're actually pretty closely related, even though they look incredibly different in, in terms of all these organisms going together. So. Boink. Let me tell you what makes them all go together. Uh, everything that's with the orange border right now, all of those organisms have uh, immature stages, or, or they're babies, if you will. They're developing juvenile uh, part of their life uh, cycle that, is, that are very different from the adult. You know this. Caterpillars are super different from butterflies. They are the same organism. If you look at the ones in the lower right-hand corner, all of these insects, they all have the juveniles or the babies, if you will, 
look very similar to the adults. They're just smaller. That's kind of basically it. And the dragonfly up there, it's just completely wacky. If you look at that as an entomologist, it's got its wings held differently. It has a different mechanism by which the wings uh, work. And um, if you look at it in the fossil record, it is much more ancient than all the other ones. So that's how entomologists would separate these things out. And um, let's look at it. Don't freak out. This is just a little bitty tree here. Um, and I'll explain it to you to the level that you need to understand it at this point. This is, um, and, and by the way, all the photographs that I have, I've tried to give credit where it's uh, required, um, but mostly they should be public domain photographs. This is from uh, Mike Engel and David Grimaldi's, uh, Grimaldi's uh, work. The two triangles on the right that are green, those are the butterflies and the flies. You can tell by looking at it, the green critters, they're more closely related. And the purple triangle critters down there, the wasps and bees and stuff like that, they're less related to the green ones. And if you work on your way down, that's how that works. It has to do with how closely related they are, those, those uh, forks. Wow, okay, so there's a lot of information there. Bam, this is the Tree of Life, and it was put together by David Hillis and um, two other scientists that he was working with, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the name. I forgot my notes. Uh, David Hillis is at UT. Um, right there, that's 3,000 species, 3,000 different organisms. That little gray haze around the edge of that circle, every gray little bitty thing there is a species. That's, and the colors indicate the different groupings and the lines as, uh, indicate how they're organized and this roughly approximates the nine million species of organisms that live on earth and that little yellow arrow orangish arrow that just appeared there that's you that's all you are in that whole big picture um that's pretty intimate this is a lot of information packed on here and it can be kind of confusing so let me break it down let's look at this really primitive uh, gif that I made on Piskel. And it's, just watch it, watch those pink boxes go up. You've got time passing. When it's at the top, that's the most recent time. When it starts at the bottom there, those boxes are at the beginning of time. And each box represents a group of organisms. So that little box at the very bottom there, that is a living population. It's pink because it is a population of organisms that is alive. What is a population? I want to define that first because as obvious as it seems, it's, it's not really terribly obvious if you think um, scientifically about it. If you took every wolf, um, all their genes, we know they have genes, Everything has a gene, a set of genes that they pass from their, uh, from themselves to their uh, offspring. Wolves are the same way. If you take all the wolves and all their genes, that is a population. So that little pink square there, that is a living population. And that is the first population in this particular tree. When evolution occurs, time is going on, you see that now there's a black square at the bottom, which is an extinct population. That's that first population. Oop. And then it has kind of changed. That population has kind of changed one from another. It has split into two different populations. There are two pink boxes there. If it's too small to see, you're going to have to trust me on it. So time has passed here, and you have lots and lots of extinct populations, and you have the ones that are currently alive in pink. I hope that makes sense. Does that all make sense so far? Yeah, I think so. All righty. And I think your wolf population is a pretty interesting example because we mm -hmm. have several different types of wolf mm -hmm. in North America. Yep. And they're not necessarily reproductively compatible for lots of reasons. Right. Yes. This, I'm making this super clean, as mm -hmm. Jen has just pointed out. It's not this clean in real life. I'm not going to go into that detail. If you're a scientist, out there pulling your hair out. Go ahead and look at David Hillis's Tree of Life again and talk, that's got plenty of things that you can complain about there too. Um, 
I'm just doing this for teaching purposes. All righty. So, oops, like Jen said, there's a, a collie right in the middle of the wolf there, unfortunately. But there's a wolf in the middle there. And if you uh, look at all these dogs around here, every single breed there came from the wolf. Every single breed. Look at the diversity there. It's an amazing amount of diversity. You have short hair, long hair, never sheds hair, naked hair, colors, sizes, shapes, and behaviors. All sorts of things that have all been pulled out of the genes of the wolf population. So, if we go back to our little tree here that we're generating, that long line that it's pretty much staying right above the very first population, right there. It's not changing much from the bottom to the top. That would be your wolf. It's not really changing a whole lot over time. It might change a little bit. You might get some speciation, like Jen is talking there, or at least some subspecies or some such, something that prevents them from mating with one another. But it's mostly the same. If you look at the difference between that critter and the one, the pink population over on the right there, let's say that is an Alaska, oh no, no, it's a Siberian Husky. That's a Siberian Husky. At, whoop, jumped too far, sorry. They were last from the same population of wolves a long time ago, where that arrow at the bottom is. And over time, the population of wolves that split off there was bred by humans to become more and more Siberian Husky. So if you look at that wolf and say the critter that's over here in this, the far left pink box, that would be something like, say, a bulldog. There's a lot of change that has happened there, even though it's the same amount of time. The genes have changed a lot. And just look at the bulldog. It's so different from a wolf, but that those things could breed together if you put them together. They're the same species. All right, so if we look at that bottom of that fork where they split oop, to the top, the difference between that split up at the bottom and the split that's on the yellow air at the top. I hope I didn't lose you there. Um, I'm not, I don't have my notes, but uh, the difference between these two critters, I think the slides got mixed up a little bit, I apologize. Uh, that is, oh, now I remember, I apologize. That's an Alaskan Malamute, and it was, uh, I'm going to go back to that previous slide, forgive me for a moment. Dogs at the bottom there. Uh, split off. They were bred from wolves in the old world, and they're about 12,000 years old. Or 12, they've been bred for about 12,000 years. And oops, it jumped. I'm sorry. Wow. Okay, so there is the North American wolves a population that has been split and uh, gave, given rise to the New World dogs. Two different events, folks. And so this critter has not changed much from the wolf. It looks very similar to the Siberian Husky, right? Because it's got the same things that what it was bred for, but it's different, different subset of genes. And it's because it was bred from a different bunch of wolves. So to summarize quickly, if you look at the two yellow arrows, the, the difference between the wolf and the other pink square is greater than the two arrows that are white. And that has to do with how much time they had, they got to evolve. If you look at these two sets of arrows, they're, the white arrows, the two populations are different, more different from the yellow, and it's because not because they didn't have more time, but because they just had greater change in the population more quickly. All righty, so back to our wolf with the unfortunate lassie right in the middle of her face. 
is everybody okay so far? Jen, have I done okay so far? No, you're doing great. <laughs> All righty. With you so far. Okay, I'm not wearing anybody out. Let's take a little breather. So that's what we got so far. Now, new thing on this. Pink boxes all across the top. And then there's that one branch right there that doesn't have a pink box. What happened there? Extinction. It's extinction, it died yep. out. Yep, it died out. This happens all the time. Lots of things go extinct. And so the entire tree, if you look at it at the very end, there are only four organisms at the top that have lived, that have um, prospered. So if we look at the whole thing again, hopefully it makes more sense now. All the way up. Over time, populations change. Time can cause populations to change. Pressure from the environment can cause them to change more rapidly, even if it's a shorter amount of time. All righty there. Now, those four at the top. Let's take a look at them up close and personal. There are four of them. And if you look at it, they all four, the last time they had a population that they all had in common, in other words, the population that they all evolved from, was way back there. So this organism and this organism both came, that was their most recent uh, common population. This organism and this organism, their most recent population that they had in common was more recent, or even more recent. So let's just pretend that this organism down at the bottom here is this little critter. And believe it or not, that is a real critter. It's a, called a finger monkey. And let's just say that over time, evolution occurred. And from that critter, we derived that split. And these two populations were derived from that. And then evolution occurred some more. And then even more. So I hope this makes it very clear that I agree with you, no matter who you are, your granddaddy was not an ape. You are no more an ape than you are a fungus. You are your own independent evolutionary pathway. It's just that our ancestor back there gave rise to these other organisms as well. We are as different from the apes as a cockroach is from a butterfly, as a bird is from a bat. I mean, it, it just depends on how many genes you have in common. So when you look at things in terms of, I don't want to look like that, you're looking at it in the wrong way, frankly. Right, that's, that's an emotional it response. It is an emotional response, and I get it. Yeah, but sure. But if you want to look at it like science does, or um, and I don't mean to sound all ivory tower, that's not the point. This is what the physical characteristics of the organisms reflect. This is what behavior reflects. This is what the genes reflect when we start taking them apart. And I'll show you a really amazing example of that in a while in these slides. So it's not uh, just something that we make up to aggravate people who want to believe that God made me perfect and wonderful and I'm modeled after something perfect. Okay, so in fact, the uh, little critter at the, at the juncture back there on the far left, that little finger monkey. He's very cute, by the way. He's super cute. Yeah, I wouldn't mind being related to that too much. Um, this is the actual animal that we believe generated all these populations at this point. Uh, whoop. My finger slipped. I'm sorry. Uh, so that kind of brings me to what we were just talking about. There's still this notion that... Uh, human beings have to be up on a pedestal. We are somehow better and unique. Um, we are unique. We are amazing. We have mastered fire. We have amazing brains. We wear clothes. I don't know, you know, that's... We have thumbs. We have thumbs, you know, but so do the great apes. And, sure. and so do pandas have evolved their own version of that. So let's just get past that for just a second, the whole pedestal thing. Are we really... Are these not cute? I mean, we're related to these as well, if you want to put it that way. And really, are, are we 
that perfect. I'm not saying that we're all unattractive and, and ungroomed and unkempt or whatever, but really, I don't, I don't see us as being that much different from uh, other animals in that way. Okay, get, look at this picture. Get over your visceral revulsion at the fact that this uh, chimpanzee is very old. He's blind in one eye. Um, he's all sorts of things that a lot of people would find uh, aesthetically unappealing. Uh, just look at the arms. Look at the side of his body. Look at the thigh and the, the musculature there. And that really doesn't look that different from us, to me. Yes, the skin color is different. Yes, they have hair. They probably look at us and think, ew, they're naked. That's really ugly. What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and when I look at this animal's eyes, she's got a lot going on back there. We, we walk, we walk on two legs, so what? So do birds, we, we dream and we sleep. Well, so do dogs. Uh, and did you know that insects sleep too? Maybe they dream, don't know. We play, so do they. We solve puzzles and so do they. We have aesthetic preferences, so do they. We farm, and so do they. We plan for the future, and so do they. We talk, so do they. We have emotions that show on our faces, and so do they. Um, it's pretty clear to all of us people looking at the young boy on the left that he's in a lot of pain, and that's from a pain study. Um, the upper right hand shows what's called pain face in horses. And if you look at the horse on A, that's a happy horse. B, the position in the ears, the eyebrows, the nostril, the way the mouth starts to clench and the lips change, gets worse and worse. And if you look at the horse in the bottom right hand picture, what's that horse feeling? Pain. We like to show off just like they do. We believe ridiculous things and so do they. We love, and there have been recent studies, MRI studies, that show that the dog's brain reacts the same way as our brain does when the dog considers us. Not so different. Horses are super stupid, right? They have theory of mind. They can read our emotions. And then there's this, which to me has um, a pretty weighty feel to it. When I look at the eyes of primates, I see a lot going on there. I don't think they're dull or stupid. I think if I were put in a very small enclosure and being as intelligent as most humans are, you become a different organism. I don't think judging them by what they are in the zoo is fair. Well, we kind of see that with incarcerated humans. They, yeah. They become different people. It's the worst torture yeah. there is. To be in prison, I just can't even begin to imagine how boring that is. And boredom is the worst torture there is. Um, well, I should not say that. People can certainly come up with something worse, but I'm saying it's bad, and it, it shows in the animals that we keep in zoos. Uh, all these things, consider. Well, we love our, our um, and take care of our infants, and so do they. Um, I don't think we're all that incredibly different. Oops, and then, ah! So there is one more thing. Just recently, uh, they have discovered, well, I guess within, I think it was 2008, they discovered a new set of genes that are super closely related to humans, and it's the Denisovan set of genes. On the right-hand side, you see the genetic uh, 
makeup of, uh, on the top of gorillas, then chimps below that in the square, bonobos below that, and then Denisovans. Denisovans um, are just as closely related to us as, say, Neanderthals. And it's a pretty good chance that every single one of us has genes from one or the other in us. Denisovan genes are actually what helps Tibetans uh, survive so well in high climates. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, it's not, it's there. Yeah. And if you look at um, human populations, it's there, mm -hmm. especially in Australian uh, native populations. We are not so far removed, and yet we are. It's, it's all kind of complicated, as we would like to think. So that's what I want people to consider when they think about humans and evolution and the icky factor. Yeah. Is it really that icky? Maybe think about it a little bit. Thank you. All right.